How's it going? Andrew here with another installment of the Creative Endeavor podcast. And in this episode, I've interviewed Anya Brock, who's a young and dynamic artist based in Perth, Western Australia. I thought Anya would be great for the Creative Endeavor podcast because she's gone so far with her career and she's certainly reached an amazing level of success. I wanted to know exactly how she made it work as a business. And we talked about so much from overcoming personal struggles to capitalizing on opportunities or even shattering those paradigms that a lot of us artists find ourselves stuck in. So without further ado, here's Anya Brock. Anya, welcome to the podcast. I'd like to kick things off with where you started your career as an artist and how you got to this point. Oh, broad question to begin. Um, yeah, so well, I I always well look. I studied fashion and textiles straight after high school, but obviously we did special art together at um, Apple Cross High School. So I think it's one of those things where the seeds were planted early. Before that, my mum always put us in drawing classes after school, things like that. Um, but I studied fashion and textiles. So I ended up starting a fashion label at the end of second year and throughout my third year. Um, and then had that label for, I think about six years. So I just ran that from Perth instead of going and getting a job. I just worked for myself from the age of 19 because <laughs> I found it easier. Wow. Um, and so, yeah, I did that for a few years and then I kind of got to a point where I felt like I wasn't really learning I'm I'm a bit rubbish at asking for help uh, and I've got a, a big belief in teaching myself how to do things which can obviously be great in some respects and then other times just completely hold you back so I just and I felt a little bit like I wasn't I wanted something bigger um so I applied for an internship in London with a fashion designer I apply, applied with Preen I think um, and Christopher Kane and ended up getting both but went with the Christopher Kane one. And he was, I mean, he's still a massive, you know, designer over there, but he was one of the big up-and-comers at the time. So that was really exciting to be in amongst that. Um, and then while I was there, I was painting, like, you know, kind of I felt a, a little bit frustrated by fashion, I guess. I, I felt in our, in our class we did a lot of drawing and we had a really great, I had a really great teacher, John Grew, who's actually a reasonably well-known WA artist, and he t he taught us really experimental drawing techniques and painting techniques, and I really connected with that. And I think the whole machine of fashion, there being the seasons that you have to stick to, just the rigidity of it, something about that. I, just, I kind of lost interest and didn't feel completely creatively satisfied, which I think a lot of people don't feel when they make money out of their creative craft. So... But kind of behind the scenes, I was always drawing or not really painting, mainly just drawing. I would draw in a in a sketchbook at night when we watch TV and my partner and I. And then I decided to – oh, yeah, I think I actually applied for um, the British Council whatever internship thing but didn't get it and then just decided to apply for, directly to designers for internships. And then – so I went to London for a couple of years. Um, and same thing, worked in an industry there. It's I felt like I kind of – did it to tick it off the list in a way and I and it was great because I I did it and then I realized that I didn't want to be there <laughs> I didn't want to work for someone else even though this was this amazing thing of working within the fashion industry you know it's notoriously you know you're not very well paid or treated amazingly obviously depending on the brand that you work at went to Richard Nickel after Christopher Kane and that was amazing beautiful people he was lovely um and so the whole time I was kind of drawing in my tiny little apartment in London and realizing that and going through a lot of personal stuff at the time, like really working through all of the issues inside myself that I felt were really holding me back in terms of connecting with people and just being a confident, issue-free kind of person. I felt like I was being kind of dragged back by these self conscious things I had about myself so I just worked really hard I did a lot of yoga and I just did a lot of solid solitary kind of confinement just working through reading a lot of stuff just really focusing on the things that I felt uncomfortable in myself about and all the while painting and drawing and you know as a therapeutic thing and I kind of realized that 
it, the contrast between the feeling the feeling that I got from when I was painting and drawing and the feeling I got when I was working for someone else it was so great and I was having such a physical reaction like my body would just kind of shut down when I would go to work I would feel like it just horrendous like fluey horrible and then when I'd walk out the door and knew that I could go home and draw I would just feel amazing so it was like a pretty obvious contrast that was happening so then I got to a point where I was like I felt like I didn't have anything more to prove to myself about being in the fashion industry or achieving anything so I moved back to Perth and then just kind of like lived as a bit of a gypsy just staying in whoever's place I could house sitting lived with my folks for six months and I was like 29 or something 28 (laughs) and then and was just painting and drawing the whole time and then I just started putting on shows and then it just kind of happened and also I think that was around about the time that I that I put myself on Instagram and that was just like the easiest platform ever you post something and people go can I buy that and you go yeah sure and then it's so is that just kind of picked, like I never really intended it to be a career. I just did it because it made me feel really good inside and made, helped me identify myself. And then it worked. It just kind of took off. That's, that's an amazing story. And there's a lot of stuff there um, to unpack. Um, if you don't mind um, talking hmm. a little bit about this, um, I think it would actually really help a lot of people out there um, because I know I get emails about this quite a bit. Um, being somebody who's kind of gone through those ups and downs myself and trying to find, you know, a way around these things that I felt were holding me back. I, I'm so glad that you you kind of shared that because th- that's something that's almost ubiquitous in this, you mm. know, career, in this choice, because creative people, I think, by and large, we, we're holding on to a lot. And there's a lot that we have to say. There's a lot we have to get out. But there's a lot of people out there that are really suffering, you know, whether it's from, mm. you know, some sort of disorder or or some sort of, you know, psychological ailment or they're just feeling down in the dumps or they're depressed or they feel anxious. Um, certainly having gone through my own stuff, I found that art was the real savior and it was the mm. only thing that would allow me to get through those times because mm. I had that one thing to rely on. I couldn't control everything that was out here, but I could control mm. that. And so that was something that I started to make, you know, my domain and really focused on that. Mm. Um, could you speak a little bit more about that? And maybe what what did you, 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 you talked about like physical exercise, like doing yoga as a way to kind of overcome that. But what were some of the other things that you did to overcome some of those struggles? Um, you know, mm, how, I read a lot of spiritual books. <laughs> right. Yeah. A lot of stuff on um, kind of stripping yourself down in terms of the person that you've been brought up to be, your nurture and how and how much of that identity is actually your own. So I kind of worked on really identifying all of these, all of the words and the things that the self-talk, the things that came into my mind and whether they were relevant to me anymore. And it was interesting because I, I was in London, I had friends there, but I didn't, I didn't party. I, I didn't have anybody super, super close to me there. Um, my housemates were great and everything, but it was, it was, I was kind of existing in a bubble and that's why it worked. I think, you know, like it was a lot about family stuff as well. And I wasn't around my family, which is, was important, I think, to really disassociate from that to kind of find out who you are aside from the values that you've been brought up in, because I don't necessarily apply to you. Um, and obviously that's really difficult for parents to hear. So you can't do that around parents. And it's, you know, like I, and even I, I, I broke up, well, yeah, my, I kind of separated from a partner at the time. So it was almost like this ending of this life that I had felt unidentified with but didn't know. It was like this kind of void beneath the surface that I yeah. couldn't put my finger on what it was until I stripped away all of the stuff. So it was a lot of a lot of reading, a lot of introspection, a lot of like written affirmations. Like this, there's a great book, The Artist's Way. I'm not sure if you've yeah, read Julia that. Yeah, Julia Cameron. I've got it yeah. right here. I've got it yeah, right here exactly. on the desk. So yeah. reading a lot of that yeah. kind of stuff and identifying what those voices are, like getting really, really quiet, lots of meditation, Yeah. lots yeah. of listening to myself and then finding out. And it was, you know, it was pretty painful. It's pretty horrible to... to oh, it's brutal. It's a, it, yeah, it's a horrible thing to... And there was a lot of sadness for me to realize that I was being so mean to myself. Right. And a lot of it for me was about body issue. You know, like I'd 
I'd had eating disorders before and I'd, I was in the fashion industry, you know, like it's yeah. brutal. Yeah. So it wow. was a lot. And, I, you know, like things like I would usually wake up and check all of the fashion blogs. So I deleted all the fashion blogs off my computer and I stopped looking at everybody else and feeling shit about myself and just decided to look inside only and not think about what anybody else, like really work hard to disregard what anybody else thinks of me. That and sounds, from that. Yeah. It, uh, that sounds yeah, amazing. That I because, don't care <laughs> well, it sounds like what you've done there, I mean, which is f- phenomenal. Um, it, and it, it is hard to do, but it almost sounds like you're, you're not looking outside anymore for validation. You're going in to kind yeah. of really find out, you know, who am I and what makes me tick? And what does this yeah. thing want? What do I, what, what am I here for? I mean, I, yeah. I do a bit of meditation myself. I don't do any yoga because uh, there's nowhere here to do it. And I don't know how, so <laughs> that's no excuse. Um, but I, I can that's say. That's a pretty good excuse. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have 485 people uh, in my town. So I, I doubt any of them do oh, any yeah. yoga. <laughs> it's oh, a oh, uh, tiny little place, but yeah, that, it's it's really interesting um, to hear you say that, and and amazing, you know, that you've you've found the strength and courage to overcome that because now you know, look at where you are, the successful, mm-hmm. you know, dynamic artist who's just kicking goals. So tell us a bit about where you are now, and and uh, you know, what's what's life like for you now? Yeah, it's funny because there was definitely like courage is definitely the word that I think about with my practice that I and I think you know, anybody who wants, who, who really strives to create something original and something that speaks about their emotions, you have to just have incredible amounts of courage because, yeah, you, you know, like, and not care what anybody else thinks. It has to be 100% you. And, and that's that therapeutic side of creating is putting something down and standing up and saying, this is me, regardless of what kind of feedback is going to come back. And there is something thrilling about that, you know, like really identifying yourself with, the work that you create. Um, but yeah, so life is pretty quiet now for me. <laughs> like it, it's kind of gone a big full circle where I started out, you know, pretty chill and then it just kind of gained momentum massively. Um, my partner, I, in, in all of it, I had a three year long distance relationship with my partner, my current partner. And he, he is a real powerhouse, lots of energy, very, very successful, person so that kind of I think buoyed me and helped me and also definitely directed me in terms of how to run a business properly like I got a lot of advice from him um so then yeah we I was in Perth a long time moved to Sydney was in Sydney for three years kind of really expanded had a studio here a studio there a store here store there um an assistant staff here like really went quite big within a few years and then now I've just consolidated back right down which is really nice I've closed my I got rid of my Sydney gallery got rid of my assistant over there had a gallery here closed that down and so now I just have an assistant who does whatever hours she needs to a week and it's just me in my studio painting a few days a week so I've got a little babe now so I'm in the studio kind of three days a week if right. I can Brilliant. um and yeah now I'm and I've got I've just got a publicist in Sydney and yeah, that's really it. My printer does all of my dispatch and printing and everything. So I've really brought it back down because I realized that most of my time, I've got so little time now that most of it was being spent on business stuff, which is fine because I do enjoy that to a certain extent. But if I don't paint, I it's, it's that lack of therapy and things get all funny inside and mixed up and kind of, you know, bubble under the surface and I need yeah. to create to release that to just keep that equilibrium fine in my life so I just realized that I I, if I'm going to if if I've got such a small amount of time I just want to paint as much as possible yeah sure do a bit of you know admin management and stuff but yeah so it's 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 nice now it's I feel like I come back to a point because as much as you know having a business with lots of you know physical stores and all that kind of stuff it that was great for a while while I had the energy but I I it's not it's not where I prefer I prefer to be mostly a creative right. and mostly painting because yeah. I never started it to be super successful. <laughs> yeah, fair enough, fair enough. I started it because it helps me, it helps me live a, a life that I enjoy. 
it's a really important getting that balance right because I feel like the business side of things yeah. can be quite overwhelming. Like all of the the, mm. the minutia of the business, you know, emails, calls, scheduling. It it seems to for me it really leeches the 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 soul and vitality out of the creative process because mm. by the time you've done all this <laughs> this stuff, yeah. you now have to go on paint yeah. and you're just dog tired. You just can't can't even get to it. Yeah. Um. So now I mean it's it's amazing. You've you've had all of these branches. You had you know you know had your Sydney store and gallery and and Perth gallery, and now bringing it back down, you're able to uh, to kind of relax into the speed of life, so to speak, which is which is amazing. Mm. Um, let's talk a bit about that kind of escalation. You, you where, where going back to the, to when you first kind of started out and you noticed that your work was gaining ground of all the people mm. that I've watched in their careers, you seem to, and, and again, this is just from the outside looking in, but I, I've always kind of been looking from afar going, holy cow, Anya is killing it. She's doing amazing. <laughs> And, and so I, I've seen you capitalize on these opportunities that have been coming your way and you've just been able to manage it, expand it and grow your business to just ride these waves. You haven't, you don't seem to have really missed any opportunities now that you've kind of scaled things back. That's a choice, you know, and, that, and that's a really, mm. you know, admirable choice. But I, there's no doubt in my mind that you could have expanded more. You know, and and so uh, tell me about when you first noticed that you were gaining ground as an artist and how you capitalized on those opportunities. Yeah, it's a funny thing because I think sometimes, you know, there's that business brain where you do something that maybe it's slightly not in your heart what you would do, but it's a smart thing to do. And then there's other times where it's like that's that would probably be really smart for my business, but I cannot stomach that. So I think it's really about those choosing which jobs are right for you and, and you know, I, I, I do everything on gut, you know, like even if something is great money or whatever but it's just a brand that I don't want to be affiliated with, I'm just not going to do it, you know, like it's, it's that pretty standard thing where it's either a money job or it's a, a passion job, you know, like I think I think it's mainly just been on gut and also just – I've never really wanted to – I haven't wanted to grow a massive empire or anything. So making sure the the voice that's dictating these decisions is the right one for you, which for me has always been like if I can get enough time painting, that's my main thing. If I, I just want to paint and I want – I don't care so much about – I don't care about the notoriety or I don't care about any kind of – I don't know, being propped up and seen as some kind of person. I don't like that's where that whole thing, not giving a shit what anybody thinks about you really helps because there's no, it doesn't feel like there's any ego involved for me. I don't do anything. So people will think I'm amazing. I do things that make sense to me and my business and the balance of my life. And, you know, like, it's just about choosing the right jobs really and making sure the voice that's deciding them is true to you. And, and even I was saying this with my publicist lately where she was like, we were talking about just expanding and what we could do with this, this, or this. And I was like, well, I can't handle much more right now. I don't want to be that much busier right now because that's just not the time of my life that I'm in. That will come again. But you know, we've, I've got a little babe, we'll have a small family soon and I'm okay with just having this as a bit of a quieter time, doing just small batch release, getting to paint as much as I want and then, you know, when I'm out of that, maybe we can tackle some bigger projects. So I think it's just about, yeah, being really conscious of what you can handle and what feels right at the time. So, Anya, that, I mean, yeah, absolutely. Uh, let, let me ask you a, a little bit, though, about how physically this this business model works. Because, again, from the outside looking in, I mean, I'm probably making all sorts of assumptions here. But, you know, I, I really do credit. That's the trick. <laughs> well, That's the business model. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's the thing. I, I, I really, I really, you know, credit you for, for just being able to create, you know, really striking, engaging pieces that resonate with people. Um, I love the fact that you're painting from a, from a position of authenticity and you're not trying to be like outrageous or trying to be necessarily original. You seem to be having a genuinely good time painting what you want to paint. Mm. 
and yeah. and the thing that I, I I can see just by your sheer following, like on on Instagram, for instance, or the success you've had with your business, is that people are really picking up what you're putting down. So besides just painting, maybe could we talk a little bit about how you create products? out of your paintings and what are the various things that you do to diversify that income? Because I get a lot of people assuming, you know, with, with what I do, for instance, that it's just a matter of painting a picture and putting it on the gallery wall. It sells, you make your money or it doesn't and you don't make anything, you know, that that's Mm. it. But one Mm. of the things that I've noticed about you is that you've been a far more clever than that. Like you, you didn't seem to ever go that traditional gallery model. It wasn't, Mm. oh, I'm going to show in a gallery. No, no, I'm going to have the Anya Brock gallery. It's going to be my gallery. And I love that. (laughs) I mean, that is so ballsy. It's fantastic. But not a lot of people would think to do that. So, so tell me a little bit about how, how you, how you make it. Well, I, I met with a few galleries, but they always kind of told me I was doing it wrong. So tell me about that. I was like, well, I, you know, there was like, there was just a kind of a condescending voice, and I think maybe I have a problem with authority, so it, I didn't, couldn't handle that. And so, and one gallery in Sydney was like, well, they couldn't, they couldn't handle my lack of my. What, what is foreseen as my lack of concept. You know, obviously I don't come from the art world. I come from the design world and that's a bit dirty to the art world, I think. Um, and my concept isn't in the subject matter of my pieces. It's in the process and how, you know, each step of the creative process, how that correlates with life and how it correlates with being able to like yourself as a person. You know, it, it's a it's a different kind of thing besides being able to say this painting is about this because this is what's visually happening in it. So I was painting birds at the time and one gallery was like, "Mm, well, it's just a bit too, you know, clean and bright and happy and, you know, maybe you should paint, maybe if you painted dead animals, Mm. dead birds. And I was like, I get that because you want that contrast. And I said, well, look, that kind of, um, that darkness usually lies in my titles rather than, you know, so there is that contrast and contradiction there but I I didn't feel the need but funnily enough now I like painting dead flowers (laughs) because (laughs) I like that idea that it's you know them them, they're kind of it it doesn't you know everybody thinks of flowers as beautiful and there's something really nice about them being craggly and dead and there's something masculine you know there's there is all of these um yeah contrast in it but and also I just I was like I'm not giving you 40 percent I've built this business I'm not giving you 40 percent you know, so I just couldn't handle that. I showed, I think I did show with a couple of galleries at the beginning, but then I was like, I was, because, because it was the age of Instagram and Facebook, you, everybody was building their own profile. And I I just happened to be doing that. I didn't even realize I was doing that, but I was like, well, I'm bringing you my clients. My clients are coming to your gallery to buy my work. So why wouldn't I just cut you out? That makes sense to me. (laughs) And also they're not going to promote me as much as Mm. I was promoting myself. And I know that gallery models totally have their role. It's just that I'm not that artist. Mm. So I was, I kind of identified that pretty quickly and, and then was like, I had the energy and, and the resources to be able to organize my own shows in different locations and different spaces. Like that's, that's the thing I think of the makeup that I have as a person, which I'm super lucky that it's all fallen into place in that I can organize all the things I can do. I can deal with people. And that was, you know, so therefore I can sort these things out on my own. I don't need someone else to do it. And I found that whenever anybody else did it, they didn't do it how I wanted it anyway. So I was like, well, I could have done that so much better in half the time for half the money. So I'm just going to do it. Let me, let me just stop you there. uh, Because I think, um, I mean, that that's amazing. What you've identified there is, is, you know, it's kind of breaking the paradigm because a lot of people, especially people in high school, like they're, they want to know, it, it's not a question that they can make it without the gallery. The question is, how do I get into galleries? And I, I just feel mm. like going, look, you're thinking about this all wrong. Mm. And there's, there's not that there's anything wrong with going with a gallery model, mm. if that's what you want to do. But myself, I found that it's been really difficult dealing with people or finding good people that I want wanted to work with. And I Mm. had to come to some sort of business deal where if the other artists in those galleries found out what kind of deal I was getting, 
um, they might have been pretty upset because I'd go in and negotiate with them. And not a lot of people mm. know that you can do that. It's like, look, here are my terms. If you want my work, this is what I'm willing to deal with. Otherwise, I'm going to do my own thing. Um, mm. and, and so I love that. I love that you even you, you had that kind of that inkling to say, look, this is a deal breaker. It's not even an option. You know, so mm. many out there will just grin and bear it. And look, more power to them because some people do fabulously well out of that model and they don't want to deal with the hassle of, of running their own premises mm. because that in and in, in of itself has got its own share of nightmares, I'm sure. Um, mm. but it, it's, it's just amazing. Yeah, it's just a different responsibility, isn't it? But I think yeah. that's once again, it comes back to me kind of really figuring myself out before I started all of this because that decision wasn't even a decision it just was a feeling I had to do it mm. wasn't a conflict in me I mean maybe there was like mm, should I should I and then I was like I just kept coming back to it. it's like no it doesn't feel comfortable it doesn't feel right and I also know that I have very limited um, social energy so to maintain relationships with galleries was really taxing for me having to because I'm a very direct person and sometimes I, I do away with the niceties because I just don't have the time or the energy. And so I realize that you have to, there's a certain way that you have to be with people to make sure people don't go to get upset and, you know, like maintaining these relate. That's why I have a publicist now because she's that person because I'm <laughs> that person to just be like, great, well, let's just, you know, flesh out the deal and then go. Whereas it's yeah. supposed to be like, hope you're well, blah, 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 you know? So I just realized that I, the more, relationships like that business relationships that I had to ma maintain in my in my life that was time away from me being able to give that energy to loved ones friends my work you know sure. it's I have I know myself and how much and what and what talking to people too much at certain times of the day I know what that does to my brain and so I just kind of knew you know it's like that thing if you know yourself you know if you know what the whole map looks like, you just you know where to go. Whereas if you sure. still haven't worked out the internal map, you're like t at every turn there's this big decision, which is really taxing. And decision making in itself takes a lot of energy. So it's like if you know that stuff already, it, it's just so much more streamlined and you just have a gut feeling. You go off that, just trust that it's going to be fine. It's, it's that trusting that if I go with how I feel is right, everything's going to work out rather than, but what if I, this could be the biggest break in the world and I don't take it and I look back and regret it? Like all of those thoughts were gone because, well, maybe they were, I mean, maybe at the time it was definitely a process. Maybe at the beginning it was a little bit like that and then the more times I've trusted that feeling and that knowing that if I do what feels right, it always worked out and it always did and I never looked back. So it just became easier to make those decisions. Yeah, right. Mm. Yeah, I, I can I can hear that, like kind of knowing that map or knowing, you know, knowing who you are is is quite integral to the whole thing actually working. Um, mm. Look, I want to want to just kind of backtrack just a little bit here um, mm. and, and let's talk nuts and bolts for a little bit if we could, um, because one of the things that I think mm. people might find really, really interesting is how you you know, you, you've, you've made these fantastic paintings that are so punchy and graphic and strong that have gotten so many more applications besides just a, a, a really nice painting on the wall. I've noticed that you've been able to do a lot of really cool things with it. So talk to me a little bit about, you know, what you've been able to do with your work and some of the various products that you've created out of these, these amazing images. Yeah, so I sell prints, canvas prints and paper prints. Um, so my works are photographed by my printer, you know, for repro, for reproduction and, um, then printed. So I sell those. I do, I have some homewares, um, kind of phasing those out really. It was one of those things where a few years ago I would get approached every week to do a homewares collab. And I was like, once again, same kind of gallery thing. I'm like, I'm just going to do it myself. <laughs> you know, there's like, yeah. why would I give you, you know, but they, they, you know, still license, obviously that's licensing my images. So, um, putting a term, putting a quantity, putting, you know, a price on an image that a person can use for however long. Um, so I do that still with a lot of different brands. That's a great passive income because, you know, it's usually an image already created and then they want to put it on their product. They're allowed to do that for a certain period of time. It's all bound by a contract. Um, and that's a great way to collaborate. I've realized that collaborating for me is that it's in the post rather than in the actual 
creating the artworks. I need to be alone. I need to be in my own space. I can't create with someone else. But the collaboration after the fact with the image is fine. Um, so, yeah, I've had we did the produce the homewares. My friend and I did that for a while out of China. Um, but, you know, once again, it's a really difficult market. We realized that, yeah, realized there were things we could have done better. Um, and then I do murals as well. So occasionally I pop out and paint a mural, less so now, but those are, you know, they're like billboards really. They're great advertising. I, so. I really I really am quite amazed at the scale of some of these murals. I mean, because you've done, you know, did I see you do a bridge underpass, like which is a pretty mm. decent sized wall? I had help with that. <laughs> I had lots of helpers <laughs> doing the background color. <laughs> wow, wow. It's, how so, long would something like that t- take you? That one we had to do in two days. I think two days um, because yeah because it flooded like the underpass flooded and we had to do it over an Easter weekend because that's a really busy underpass and we had to close the traffic and so we did it over Easter because obviously we thought it would be this was with form they're great they organized it all we thought it would be less of a you know busy traffic time but so basically one day it was terrible rain and half of the you know underpass was under a heap of water so we had to flag that day and then the next so painted the next two days um, and we, and funnily enough, like two days prior to that, it was this big um, kind of street art festival type thing. I'd painted like a bunch of windows, so probably about seven or eight birds across some window fronts. And then, you know, two days later, went and did the underpass and was very early on pregnant and didn't know it. Oh, wow. <laughs> so I was, felt so horribly grumpy and just <laughs> angry the whole time. <laughs> I just felt like rubbish I just felt so tired and you know it just was a it wasn't it wasn't great but smashed it out like I really enjoy just painting fast and getting it there's something really thrilling about doing murals because you just get it done really fast it's large scale so your whole body it's kind of you know this like therapeutic dance that you do so yeah but but, so for that I had um, all of the form helpers there was probably about five people painting the background Fantastic. Which is great because that was brick and I don't like just painting plain colour <laughs> <laughs> on brick. <laughs> brilliant, brilliant. So, the, uh, yeah, I can hear that there's so many different forms here that this business takes for you and so many different ways that you can mm-hmm. make money out of it. Um, and I hope that anybody listening would be able to hear that there are options available to them, not just one mm. kind of set path. Um, mm. So how would how would one go about you know, even entertaining the idea? What if somebody was like a graphic artist and they did computer drawing or they they did something that was, you know, graphically very strong, maybe not too dissimilar from what you do, and they wanted to get into a similar licensing type deal? How would somebody approach that industry as a whole? What would be some of your recommendations? Yeah, well, that's the bit of, that's kind of the pickle with um, licensing deals. And this is what I've been discussing with my publicist lately. Uh, the, the things that I've always done have always come to me, which means you have leverage because people want you. So, of course, they're willing to pay you for your work. Wow. And this is the difficult thing with wanting it is that if you approach other people with your imagery, obviously, if they're not even thinking about a, a collaboration with an image, they they're not probably willing to pay that much money. You know, there's no leverage there. So yeah, yeah. it's one of those difficult things. I always just tell people to just, because people say, how do I put myself out there? I don't really think it's necessarily about, yes, you need to be seen, but if your work is any good, you will be seen. You, people will pick it up and they'll recognize it and you'll get followers. You know, followers are a bit, it's difficult now, the Instagram, Facebook game, because, you know, without advertising, it's really hard to grow organically. Um, but yeah, I think yeah so re- recently my publicist and I would you know she was like great let's let's approach a bunch of brands and try and upsell you to bigger brands than me um but it doesn't it just doesn't it's really difficult they took a long time to get back a lot of them weren't really interested because obviously and obviously if we did it there's when when is the discussion about how much because I've come to them mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so it's a really interesting um thing there where you kind of need to just work on your brand work on your practice and be seen put yourself out there like in in terms of putting yourself out there yes you need to I did 400 shows you know in two years I just said yes to everything absolutely everything for a couple of years well maybe three or four years actually 
Um, and but you know, like I'm a workaholic. I will I put work above everything. I used to work seven days a week. I had you know my partner was in Melbourne, so I didn't really have anybody that I had any time commitment to. So I would just go into my studio every day and work all day, hang out with friends at night, just the same, same, same. So I don't really, I never, I'm not good at leisure. I don't really know what to do with myself if I'm not working. So, <laughs> oh so there's my also gosh. things th- like that. <laughs> I think we're kind of experience. Oh my goodness. Yeah. You know, it drives Rachel nuts because, um, you know, I, she's used to it now after, after nearly 10 years with me, but um, she's... Uh, <laughs> We, when we when we go on holiday, I mean, she still says the last holiday that we actually had was our honeymoon. And I, I mm. remind her that, no, I was even working on our honeymoon because yeah. I had the camera with me. I was like, oh, reference, 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 you know. Yeah. So, I don't like holidays. I don't yeah, like them. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to yeah. do. <laughs> so, I, get, I go into a weird kind of, hmm. not depression, but I feel really uncomfortable on holidays because yeah. I don't have my, I don't have a schedule. I don't really sightseeing for me just doesn't I just like I could see that on my computer and I could probably grab that image and do something with it you know like sure there's I don't there's and I remember going I've done quite a lot of traveling considering I don't really like it but I remember traveling with my sister when I was like 22 or 23 or something backpacking which is just like my idea of absolute hell (laughs) people everywhere (laughs) no privacy you know like just horrible and and I just remember thinking, like people would just felt, I remember thinking the affinity you feel with looking at that scene of something or meeting all these people and having these life experiences is what I feel when I'm by myself in my studio. Yeah. yeah. And it was really hard to relate to people because I was, I just kind of turned into a weird mute. But in saying that, I do have great memories from that. And I know now it's this weird thing in my life where I don't, I know the things that I need to do that are difficult for me and I usually wouldn't do them. I have to do those things to keep that balance right because if I just do whatever I want all the time, I would just drown in my own shit. You know, like I would, my head would just do me in and I would be alone all the time and I would go crazy. Mm. So I know now there's the things that don't come as naturally to me, but I have to do them Mm. to be kind of a happier person. Sure. Or more balanced, sure. and we, we, you know, I used to be like balance, whatever, no way. You know, my mom would always be like, "It's all about balance," blah blah blah. And now I'm kind of like, "Yeah, I understand the balance. I get it." You know, the stuff that that's a really interesting word because I feel like it's thrown around so much nowadays. And I've had a lot of people oh, tell yeah. me, and I even have people emailing me now. Like when I send out a newsletter, they're like, "Oh, just slow down. Remember the balance in life. You know, everything in moderation." And I feel like it just doesn't work with me anymore. Uh, you know, personally, because mm. uh, I I reckon recognize that I'm an out of balance person. For me, my balance looks very different than my neighbor's Mm. balance. You know, Mm. we're simply living life according to our values and what's most important Mm. to us. And who has the right to say what that is? For me, I'm very much like you, you know, I, I, I have to be working all the time and in my studio. And then when I do have downtime, like I just want to spend it with Rachel or, you know, walk the dogs. Um, you know, I've got a handful of very close friends and I will catch up with them, but also living so isolated and remote. It's very difficult to do that now. Mm. Um, but I, 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 I relate totally because I just, I want to be in that space doing my thing and don't bother me while I'm doing it. Mm. Mm. <laughs> you know? But it's, but it's interesting. I think I went through a time of really, really going completely in that direction and having this idea of what and what kind of an artist's life I wanted or the, mm. the idea of the life that I thought I was going to live. Mm. And as I was going down that trajectory, I just realized that I would use people. I was probably didn't have a lot of empathy. I was probably a bit of a jerk more so than now. Um, and I, there were, I didn't ha- I, I didn't regard personal relationships very highly. And yeah. then, so then I would work and I would, you know, be with people, or, you know, and then when I was alone, I felt really alone, like right. really alone in terms of those were the times that I was tired and I just wanted to hang out with someone and have a cuddle and not, you know, it, it just be chill, not be all about me and all about this kind of yeah drive to achieve and to this and to that blah, blah, blah. so I think I think I re I had a pretty sobering realization that the life that I thought I was going to live was perhaps not was some kind of glamorized version of something and mm. that 
what I wanted and what I the life I wanted to live required these things and those so therefore it's it's kind of just like accepting that you have to work in life for things you know accepting the way things yeah. are and going okay well then if I want that if I want to have a stable and really supportive relationship then I need to put work into that sure. and then if I need if I want to have a family I am going to have to give up some of my time for that and just I mean it's always a really difficult pill to swallow because right. that balance, obviously, as soon as you get into your creative practice, it just swallows you and you want to live in it, especially when it's good. Mm -hmm. So it's really, it's that, you know, that's what I'm going through right now, this conflict of, you know, being this, being a mom at home, it's a really domesticated life. And sometimes that does my head in. Obviously, my child is beautiful. I love him. That goes without saying. But my brain is just in work mode most of the sure, time and I just sure. want to be in my studio. <laughs> yeah, so it's a, you know, and then I fall out of that where I'm like, oh, work is, you know, I'm not, I'm in the middle of projects and I'm not feeling super driven or something and I'm just happy to sit back and chill and, and then home life is great and I'm really a relaxed, happy, nice person to be around. <laughs> but other times yeah. I'm difficult. <laughs> You know, I, there's there's a lot of people as well asking me, let me pass this question off to you um, about how to find that motivation and inspiration. Now, we've already covered a little bit of this and just what we're talking about right now, because I can hear with somebody like you, and this is certainly the case with me, you don't need to motivate me. I don't, I'm not mm. looking for motivation. I'm there already mm. doing it. Um, mm. That's not to say I don't go through my own little funks, you know, and, and kind of you know, feel a little bit down and out. I mean, everybody goes through that type of stuff, but I'm, mm. I'm very quickly able to get back up on the horse and just keep going, you know, and, and mm. just keep plugging away in the studio. But for somebody that would be suffering with some sort of lack of motivation or lack of drive, what would you say? Could you speak to that? Because, I mean, you mm. strike me as somebody that, you know, also just has this thing in you, you, you know, you've, you've mm. got to do it. No questions asked. I mean, what you're, what you're telling me right now, you know, you've got this forced almost downturn in your life to be able to focus on the really important things, which mm. is, which is a choice. And, and that it's awesome, you know, and, and to hear you talk about it in these terms, it's really, it's really kind of, um, you know, illuminating in a way, because it just sounds like you're in total control here, even though, you know, there's this war going on inside, you know, Mm, home, yeah, that's I'm not but, in control of that. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, you're, you're 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 making you're making a decision and a choice. But there's a lot of people out there. They're just they're just struggling to get off the yeah. couch. Yeah, I mean, I just think there's so many factors. You know, like I, I'm I'm very lucky that I don't suffer any kind of depression or any kind of anxiety or you know, there's so many things that can really make people's lives difficult. And I am lucky that I don't struggle with that. I'm generally a pretty energetic person. Um, but yeah, I think that motivation thing, it comes down to so many different things. Like luckily within my personality, I just happen to be a very disciplined person that comes quite naturally to me. I'm always drawn towards things that require discipline. Um, and that's a big thing. Discipline is if, if you're not naturally a disciplined person, that's, it's hard because as sometimes you just, you just have to show up even like it's that whole thing of sometimes a job is rubbish and laborious and often parts of paintings you just have to get through those bits to do the fun bits but it's that practice I always think about you know with meditation or a lot of the books I would read it was always about the monks just doing the work and that's that's the biggest learning thing you can ever have is you just have to do the work you just have to show up all the time and everything else will take care of itself mm. so yeah motivation and inspiration I think knowing your own cycles is really important and knowing when because I think and this, you know, I found this out in TAFE. I started to become aware of when my whole creative cycle might be completely different to the schedule we were given for an assignment. So we might be given six weeks, but I could realistically turn that around in two because I just didn't. I'm a person that I research and then I, I have an idea in my head of how it's going to look in a way. And I don't, I don't need to further process that. It's usually my first idea is the most potent and they were all about more and more and more and research and develop and develop and develop. And I was like, well, I would do that. And I did it for a few assignments. And then I would just, they would, it would just become so muddied that I'd just come back to the first idea because that was always the one that stuck to me, you know, like, and, and I work really well under stress. So I was like, great, I'll just, especially in third year, I was like, I'll just run my label for most of the time. 
And then when I have to pop in and do assignments, I'll just get the assignments done, you know, because I didn't need as much time. So I think it's about really being aware of your own process. I know, mm. I know how I work and I know when that feeling of I'm inspired but it's not quite there yet so I'm going to keep watching movies and listening to music and looking through things and kind of filling that well till I've got that idea fleshed out and then it happens really fast you know like I paint really really fast and that's that's the thrilling thing for me and so it's all about knowing when to because it's futile to to start something when you, it's not cooked inside you yet because you're just bashing away at something that's not quite right and I think that's where a learning that process and having that that process kind of smashed into me for three years while I was studying at TAFE you get to know it so well, you know, it's, it's very different if you do it once and then you're like, mm, you know, it's, it's like exercise. You get that muscle really fit and you know what it is and you know it well. So it just becomes easy to do it each time. So I think, I think breaking down that I'm not motivated and I'm not inspired, there's reasons why. So flesh out the ideas, reasons why, and then the idea will come, you know, mm -hmm. and also just not placing your practice in a really you know, really kind of precious manner, just know that the creating the thing is not, that's the easy thing. That's the, you know, that's the thing that you should be able to do with your eyes closed or when you're extremely tired or, you know, like I'm, when I'm tired, if I've had a rubbish night with Harry or I, the things that I find really difficult are, you know, making decisions and doing stuff for clients or writing emails or whatever. Whereas I can paint, no problems. It doesn't, right. I can do that whenever I feel the worst and that's the thing that makes me feel best. So I think not not placing your practice on such a pedestal that you have to feel so specifically a certain way to actually create. Mm -hmm. There's so many different levels of creating. You know, I don't usually do sketches or drawings before, but, you know, sometimes I know that I just need to do a charcoal drawing just to get that energy out. But, you know, so there's so many different facets. It's not just this linear thing. There's like all of these different things you can be doing and a lot of it is research a lot of it is looking at things and figuring out what that feeling is inside you and exploring that and you know whether it's with like I watch a lot I used to watch more less time now but I watch a lot of movies and tv and I listen to music and I just you know I, I put as much in to be able to identify what's in there and then I pull something out from it wow so you actually you Talk to me about that. That's that's very interesting. I try to avoid movies and TV. Um, of oh, course, I, I, I succumb sometimes. Um, but, uh, you know, sometimes you're just like so mentally shattered that at the end of painting, you know, 12 or 14 hours in the day, you're like, I'm not good for anything except for just Netflix and chill. That's it. <laughs> but um, I watch movies while I paint. How do you do that? <laughs> well, I just listen to them, you know, oh, you just on my computer. Them. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, and I just have my headphones on because I live vicariously because I'm not s super extroverted. I am just s incredibly drawn to all level of human emotion and all of the stuff that bubbles away under the surface and the the intricacies and the things that don't make sense in people. And so I live vicariously through characters in shows. Right. Wow. So I become obsessed with shows and I watch them like three times over. Can you can you give me an example of something that you've seen in a movie or a TV show and how that inspired a specific work? Well, it's not really as literal as that. Okay, sorry. Because, <laughs> because yeah, I know it like seems like they should be able to draw those things, but I'm trying to think about bodies of work that related to something. Right now, I'm just obsessed with Big Little Lies. I just keep watching that over and over again. That soundtrack is just amazing. It's just so it gets to the very depths of your soul. Is that the one? Um, is that a, the recent one with Nicole Kidman and uh, mm. Reese Witherspoon? And yeah, ah, uh, right, yeah, I'm okay. Guessing you haven't seen it. <laughs> I, no, no, I, I've I've caught it. Um, you know, yeah. Rachel and I watched um, watched that one. I, I'm not great with the name. I couldn't even remember the name of the show to begin with. But uh, no, it was a good yeah, show. Yeah. It was a good show. I think as well because it's about women. You know, like it's about women. It's about mothers. You know, there's very much kind of a a lot of correlation there with me. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I don't know. Oh, I was watching Unreal. Have you seen Unreal recently? No, not Which even is just, heard of that. Oh, it's so good and it's just so horrible at the same time. It makes you feel dirty, but it's just like – so it's about 
um, it's on Stan. It's about the behind the scenes and how they produce all of the contestants on The Bachelor. So it's right. not a reality TV show. It's a constructed TV show about reality TV and just how it's all about the ho- most horrible parts of humans and how they would manipulate people to do certain things right. and how they would feel slightly bad but really feel nothing. So, you know, like I'm just – I'm mm. interested in – shows that are really going to kind of make you feel uncomfortable. <laughs> well, that, wow. Wow. <laughs> Makes so, me happy. <laughs> it's so strange because, I mean, your your paintings evoke a sense of comfort and harmony and ease. I hope you don't mind yeah, me saying it, that because it? I look at them like the Proteas <laughs> behind you, for instance. Like, no. like I mean, yeah. Rachel has been on me for, for ages just kind of saying, hey, we should do something big and modern. And I think what we're going to have to do is maybe just get a couple of Anya Brocks in the house. So she'll be, <laughs> you know, she'll be happy. She'll be happy. Um, she's like, why don't you just do a big bird or some big flowers? I'm like, no, we'll leave that to Anya. <laughs> I'm going to go paint a mountain. <laughs> yeah. You know, when I when I look at your work, they really evoke this really fun, spontaneous, vibrant feeling. And they, they seem overwhelmingly positive. So tell me about this juxtaposition that you have with the titling of the work. Yeah, I think I'd, I don't like anything that is like visually referenced in the title, number one. And then I also don't like just just any kind of like purity of all the way through that's why I have a real problem with this whole (laughs) holistic movement that everybody is just love and light because nobody is everybody's got their darkness and that and that contrast is what I'm interested in so I quite like naming my titles of my work that are usually really um, bright and happy with something a little bit more ominous and alluding to there being something bubbling away under the surface wow give me an example of that um so lost inside is a good one um, unending discontent, a worthy distraction. So just, you know, like, it's like a, I really enjoy the, the, the kind of intensity of longing, that feeling of longing. It's like we put all of our energy into longing. And after having a three-year long-distance relationship, that was a feeling I was well acquainted with. Yeah. But another one, f- fulfilled by fantasy, living in moments without identity, the disconnect, um, you made an island out of me. So, yeah, I like, I also like kind of um, putting t- words together that don't really make sense, like rehearse spontaneity. So, the idea of. That's a nice one. I like that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's just yeah. something really nice about contrasting and contradicting words and what yeah. that then evokes, you know? Yeah, because it starts this whole conversation going in your head, doesn't it? And it Mm. creates a really interesting space, especially when they seem jarring with with the actual painting itself. Mm. Assumed intimacy, I really like as well. Right. Well, it's fascinating work, Anya. Beautiful stuff. (laughs) And I'm not just saying that. Like, I genuinely appreciate what you're doing and and genuinely, you you know, I've been looking at it for a while, just going, wow. Um, because I think, I think part of it, what I see when I look at your paintings is a way that I wish I, I could paint because I'm not actually capable of it. I, I mean, I, I would sit down and detail every bit of yeah, fuzz right. that is on the protea pedal. <laughs> and I think it takes a certain amount of sophistication and confidence to allow things to be, you know, broken down to geometric shape or line or simplified color in a way that it's just going to snap off that canvas. Um, Sophistication or laziness. There's also that. I don't don't see it as lazy either. I know. No, I I mean, I was always really, I studied abstract, abstract expressionists when I was in TAFE and I loved that emotion in mark making. That was what I was obsessed with. And I think I just found a way to find my own language within that because I don't like detail. I find detail so tiresome. And so I find the, the laziest way for me, the easiest way for me to put something down to indicate something and to mm-hmm. express something. And so, it, so that often ends up in these kind of um, childlike marks. And, you know, sure. But then also I have a really good understanding of color. So that balances out that idea with you know, the sophistication mm-hmm. comes in the color palettes whereas the mark making can be quite rudimentary sometimes. And I don't really know. I use terrible quality paintbrushes and I, I taught myself how to paint. I don't really 
know what I'm doing. I'm just experimenting. <laughs> Well, I think I think the proofs in the pudding and the results. Speak I think it's for going themselves. okay. <laughs> I think it's going just fine, Anya. You you'd be right. Um, uh, you know, because you, you've got a certain. So, are, are you are you a um, you're acrylics or oils or acrylics? Acrylics. Yeah. I don't have the patience for oils. I like the idea of the end result, but I, that process is just not for me. I did it once, and all my brush my brushes just ended up in the bin <laughs> because I didn't wash them out properly. Oh, wow. And I was like, you know, it just, and then it's like dust, dust is going to settle on that. And are you, your oils, huh? 100%. Yeah, of course you are. That's so in line with your process and who you yeah, are. I mean, we yeah. could have figured that out when you were 12, that yeah. you would have been an oil painter. Yeah. One thing I'm noticing and loving about this picture that I'm seeing around you is, is we're in your studio right now. I can see the paint mm. uh, to your, to your right and the paintings mm. over your left shoulder would- and, and, and so tell me, uh, tell me a little bit about your studio space, if you don't mind, and what you think makes a really good creative space. Yeah, it's funny. I think I've had this space actually since about 2012, but I have been in Sydney half that time. Like I just kept it because it's in the middle of Frio. It's like five minutes from my house. So I always knew that I didn't want to lose it. And also it was kind of a storage facility for half of that time. But I did work in a few different places in Sydney. I had a group studio and in um darlinghurst and i found that really difficult but i held on to it for a long time because i was like i should be able to create here this everybody does this like it's really common obviously in sydney to have group studios because space is such premium and nobody can afford their own space yeah so everybody obviously was having shared spaces in studio in sydney and so i went into it thinking i should be able to do this and i think this is what a lot of people do and this is how you figure out how you work i should be able to work like this everybody does right but then I realized I didn't work like that in TAFE. We had a third year room and everybody had their sections, you know, their little desk where they would set up all their stuff. And I would set it up to make it look like I was working there. And then I'd go home and work because I just couldn't work in that shared space. And it was just it's not even something I really acknowledged at the time. I was just like, I can't get anything done here. I'm going home to do it. And then I'd work, you know, at home on it. So in the same thing in that space, there was sometimes there wasn't even anybody there, but it was just like I didn't have four walls. I just had two walls and it wasn't enough to contain my creative energy and it was cold and it was up three flights of stairs and I had to get the bus there, which is like around people for 45 minutes before I could get to my place and that completely messes my head up being around people. And then, and then someone else moved in right next to me and her desk was like 30 centimetres behind my desk and it was just – insane like I just realized I couldn't work in that space but of course I kept it for like a year and a half Mm. um and then I let go of that and then worked in a place in Sydney like in a um in one of the rooms in my house someone moved out of their room so I was like great I'll turn that room into my studio and that's what I did in Melbourne when I was there with my partner for a while as well I just turned his lounge room into a studio so it was always like comfortable home places for me and I had home studios here as well but then they you know I had a home studio in like a little granny flat that I was living in which of course doesn't work because you're just faced by your work all the time and it was you know I went insane so then this place is great because I mean it's cold in winter and hot in summer and there's pigeons and you know there's definitely there's there's no windows um as you can see it's all just fluoros but there's something about it whereas there's no windows to look outside and get distracted like it's just it's like a tiny jail cell which is something about that I just find so comforting (laughs) Wow. Like even when I was in London, I had this tiny little bedroom, one bedroom, like one single bed in it and like maybe a meter space all around it. But I just loved it. There's something about having everything taken away from me and me knowing I have to be in this space for a period of time. And I don't know if it kind of goes back to like when we were young, we had a really slow and quiet life when we were brought up. Like we didn't watch, it didn't feel, it didn't feel like we watched a lot of TV. We just like would make little cubbies and weave and mm. do creative stuff all the time. And there's something about coming to terms with boredom mm-hmm. and knowing that like my dream is just to have nothing booked in to be able to go into my studio and just do whatever I want all mm-hmm. the time. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I mean, I've got a home studio as well in our house, which is great small room you know it's fine and it was great for when I had Harry because I could just pop in and paint whenever he was sleeping but then there reached a time where I just felt like even when my, when Harry was going to my mom for two days a week I would still work from my home studio even though I had this space 
and I just felt I couldn't get in that headspace. I was still in home domesticated headspace and then I just needed to be able to detach from that completely. So I moved back into this a few months ago, maybe two months ago. Hmm. It's been great. I've been getting heaps done. So it's like fantastic. I think it's just figuring out your what you need. Some people are extroverts and they need people around them to work and they need to talk to work and yeah. and then yeah. other people need their own space. So I think yeah. it's you just have to try a few things out and once again just always be super aware of your inner dialogue and what's yeah. happening yeah. and and don't force any point. Just kind of sit with it and see. And you naturally gravitate towards places that you work well in. We we just do. So you you strike me as somebody who's very organized, though. I mean, just from the very limited view <laughs> that I have. This joint. Well, no. Uh, give, give me a tour. <laughs> Can you spin me around? Come on, let's have yeah. a look. Yeah. Well, so look over here behind that is a heap of boxes that were from my um, gallery. Yeah. Cool. Some vertical All storage of there. My desk. I'm really not organized. Wow, really you, you hit that well, Anya. <laughs> and then over here is just like more crap. <laughs> brilliant, brilliant. I just hide everything behind stuff. Yeah, cool, but yeah, cool. I um my <laughs> you know my computer's a mess, my hard drives are a mess. I have people in my life that are organized, so I don't have to be. <laughs> That's I've got wonderful. A well, I've hey. got an accountant. I've got an assistant. <laughs> Well, that's that's really interesting too. That you seem to have delegated a lot of the um, the important kind of menial mm. tasks to people who have got that higher in their list of values than, than totally. you do. Um, and had that that can be a balancing point. I mean, for me, I found that I wasn't able to do it until I had enough money to be able to afford yeah. those people. Totally. But um, did you find that you actually, when you finally made that transition, that you ended up making more and doing yeah. better success-wise? Definitely. Of course. It makes sense. You know, like I did all that stuff in the beginning and I guess because I had the drive to, I managed, but obviously I was, you know, pretty rubbish at paying on time. You know, just like I, I don't, I'm terrible at that kind of stuff. I don't keep my, I didn't ever used to keep my receipts, you know, all that stuff. So, but I did it for as long as I needed to. And then I was like, I'm just going to get a bookkeeper and an accountant now and they can handle all of that. And I got an assistant and it actually had an assistant for quite a long time, but I wasn't really delegating to her because it was, you know, control thing. And then I broke my, I got hit by a car and broke my arm. So I couldn't actually type or paint or do much really for a long time, but especially the emailing and typing. So I was forced to delegate a bunch to her and it was the best thing ever because then she, you know, she was really great. She was super organized, way, you know, really organized. She was in Sydney and nailed it and allowed me to have more time to run things from a higher level. So it's, yeah, definitely recognizing when you can just, mm. yeah, like let that go a little bit. And definitely, obviously, it helps to have money to pay people, but you do need to invest money to make money. Yeah. So obviously, even if you don't need to be flush to be able to have someone to do the jobs better than you, because ultimately then, yeah, it's just knowing what your time is best spent doing, mm. especially if your time is more valuable than those jobs. You know, I, I, I love hearing about, you know, some of the things that you've done with this mindfulness and kind of getting in touch with this side of yourself and, and kind of not shedding the ego, but recognizing it for what it is. And, mm. and for me, that was huge as going, hang on, I'm not my persona. I'm not my past. And mm. I'm not this voice in my head that's judging me right now. Um, I'm this weird, complex bundle of energy and all I need to do is focus on really what makes me happy and spend the time mm. with those people who I feel the most connected to. Mm. And the minute you but just... It's still yeah. very thrilling being impressive. You know, that's the other thing. It's really, that's like not something to be... And I know that I, I totally get a complete ego boost and just like a... And it's completely human too to go and do a massive mural and impress people. There's something great about that. And it's really important for humans to feel impressive. And I don't think that people should ever, you know, do that thing of like, oh, no, I don't need, like I, I need people to like my work. I'm aware of that. I'm aware that half of my practice is doing something and then it having a good response. Mm. So mm. I'm, I'm, I can't create in a bubble and only create work that appeals to me. That's like I'm completely aware of that. But I also, I guess I'm aware of that if it doesn't, feel right I can't just keep pushing out stuff that I'm not interested in anymore because I just get depressed and you know rubbish but at the same time sometimes when I'm don't really have anything new I'm working on and I just am in a bit of a lull it's like maybe I'll just do something that I know 
is going to get a great response because sometimes you just need that little boost and that's totally yeah. fine. Well, just it's, like a little it, thing to keep yeah. you going. It is nice. It is nice having a boost. I must admit, though, um, at first it really made me feel quite uncomfortable. Um, but now what it kind of generates in me is this sense of responsibility where I feel like I have to continuously just I have to show up. I have to show yeah. up. I can't I can't yeah. have a lull. I can't have any any downtime um, because you know th there's something that I that I have to do here. Um, mm. But I I really yeah I appreciate that because I I think um, you know I I I think yeah look sometimes sometimes it's okay to go for for what you think will generate that traffic response or mm. you know reaction. Um, Mm. There's something very interesting, though, that I will say, you know, also being a bit of an outsider just from moving to Australia when I was very young and recognizing from an early age that culture. There are various cultures on the planet, but Australia is one of those cultures where you have this thing called the tall poppy syndrome. And I'm so mm. glad that you don't seem to have any aspect of that, or at least you're not really paying attention to it, because I always believe that it's important to have ambition, goals, and, and, and aspirations. And one of the things that I noticed is when you communicate that or voice that, in particular in in certain circles within Australian culture, the tall poppy syndrome comes out where the tallest poppy gets chopped down to level it down to everybody else's level. Um, I don't know what yeah. that is. Have you ever found that? Or And I, I, when, I, when I say that, I just want to preface this with yeah. saying this is not a racial statement by any means. Oh, it's no, no, it's, no, no. it's yeah, an observation of, of culture. It um, is well known. Yeah. Yeah. I don't really – I mean, it's weird, isn't it? I would just immediately look at that and go – um, it's people's own insecurities, not wanting anybody else to. But I guess the thing, you cultivate a bubble that you live in and the people that I hang out with, um, they don't really, we all just support each other. So there's none of that. I don't even really, and I can't even think of a time that anybody has ever been like that towards me, but because I've been very conscious about blocking people like that out. That's it's really <laughs> Because cool. I don't. Yeah. want to be around anybody who has that kind of thing of like oh you know a sideways glance and like oh they're da 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 I you know they've just they've got no time for that and it, it just it, for me that just denotes a real lack of intelligence which I don't sure. really care for but I, one of the most profound experiences though that I had with that was with Mr. The maths teacher at Apple Cross Senior High School. Oh yeah, he was a bully, though, wasn't he? Well, he was a hard man. I think. I mean, I think he was going through his own struggles. Uh, I'm sure, but um, he unfortunately is no longer with us. In fact, I'm going to bleep his name out of that. <laughs> yeah, but I didn't um, realize. But, I don't uh, even remember what he looks like. A uh, white hair. Um, mustache kind of looked like an old yeah. Tom Selleck in a way, but yep, not, yep, yep, not, yep, yep. not the good looking kind. Um, but uh, yeah, he I remember. Had his stuff. He had his stuff. He had his stuff for sure. I mean, he had cats. So, uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> but I um, I remember going up to his desk and, and he said, you know, your grades are slipping. Where are you going in life? And I said, oh, I want to be an artist. And he was like, what the heck are you thinking? You know, and that was my first kind of real wow. profound experience of having somebody go, you can't do it, kid. You know, you're not going to amount to yeah. anything. And I was wow. like, whoa. Yeah. I never had that. My, my my parents were always incredibly. I mean, as soon as I went into the fashion genre, that that gave them peace because I think they thought there was money in fashion, which is kind of ironic now mm. because there's more money in art for me than fashion. But I don't. It, I, it's weird because I I feel like this is a really common tale of people being discouraging throughout your life, and I just cannot hear any of it. I don't know if I just blocked it out because I. Or if I just never came across anybody saying, you won't be good at that or that won't be good, you know, like even, I don't know, everybody's, I just feel like everybody's always been super encouraging and nice to me. <laughs> but maybe that's just in my head. <laughs> <laughs> uh, look, you know, that's great. It's great. That's just your story, Anya. And that's, that's fantastic. Yeah. Now, look, let's, um, thank you so much for your time. You've been really, really generous um, with this today. I really appreciate it. I love it. talking about this stuff. It but, makes it, you know gets my insides going fantastic well look i i want to i want to just kind of end this the way i tend to end many of these podcasts with um the question if there was one piece of advice or if there was a 
maybe maybe a few pieces of advice really uh, that you could offer to anybody young and up and coming to absolutely kill it in this art game what would that advice mm. be lose any notion of killing it in the art game number one oh. <laughs> because you you're reaching towards an end result and then you're only ever going to be dis disappointed you know it, i think it has to be a far bigger approach in that Yes, have in mind that you want to do something creative. Don't have any notions of success in mind. Obviously, that's always it's what we all think about. I remember reading magazines and going, I want to be the person interviewed in the magazine. Of course, there's always that drive there, but that can't be the thing dictating a lot of your decision making because I think it will thwart you. I think it's it has to come from the heart if you, if you want that longevity and therefore figure out who you are. I mean, it's really hard to bring on a life crisis because that's something I think just happens at certain times in people's life and that's that's when you really define yourself. But I think in terms of, I think there's the technical side of things, which is like the physical, learn lots of different techniques, do all of the stuff. But at the same time, if you don't know who you are, what's driving any of that? What's driving the whole thing? You know, like I think the big thing is really figuring out who you are. And if you are a creative, you're naturally inquisitive. You probably naturally got a courageous spirit. So, of course, you're going to find that path anyway. So I think, like, just devour information. Read, you know, be have it at the forefront of your mind at all times and it'll happen. And also just rest in the knowing that it'll happen and be fine about that. It's that difficult thing of, like, you, there's nobody can feel inadequate all the time. There's times of feeling inadequate when you're putting yourself out there and learning something new and, you know, that it's thrilling and it's a bit scary, but you can't live there all the time. You have to come back to your safe place and cultivate that and work on that skill. And, you know, it's like a s skateboarders or anybody who does tricks, you know, like you, you, you learn something new and then you do it for a while and then you learn something else new, you know, like you just keep moving forward. So I think just, just keep devouring stuff. Like I don't think there's any magic way. It's just your way. And then the good thing is, if you figure out who you are, you figure out what makes you happy, it might not even be art or creating that makes you happy. You know what I mean? Like it might it might take a different path, but the whole point is you got there by figuring out who you are. It didn't maybe you didn't reach great success, you know, like I wanted to be a fashion designer, but come to think of it, did I just say that when I was little because that's what my sister said she wanted to do? You know, like <laughs> yeah, for there's sure. this weird thing and then that has led me and she was always the painter. She always painted in special art and I was like, I hate painting. And then now I'm the one doing painting. <laughs> Go figure. Wow. But so I think it's one of those things you just got to, everybody's just got their own path. I think you just have to be ballsy. You just have to be really courageous all the time. Be willing to take the hard road for the better result yeah. rather than taking the easy road. But you take the easy road a certain amount of times and you go, this isn't returning anything. I'm not feeling anything I want. And then you build up the courage and then you take the big leap and then you figure out that everything is always going to be okay. So leaps are necessary. Do them daily. You know? Anya, this has been really inspiring. Um, oh, good. Can, uh, can you tell people who are listening and or watching um, where to find you and uh, what your social links are so they can check out some of your fabulous work? Sure. So it's pretty much all on my website, anyabrock.com, A-N-Y-A-B-R-O-C-K. My Instagram is Anya Paintface, which most people mistake for any of Paintface because I started it in 2012 and didn't think it was going to be a big thing. <laughs> <laughs> Much like my Skype name, Anya is cool. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know when you're like, oh, I've got to think of a fun name. And yeah. I mean, Anya Paintface, it works now, but it was just I don't have any dots in between any of it. It doesn't make sense. But here we are still. <laughs> well, now that, that Instagram, uh, Instagram name is blowing up. So people check mm. it out. It's fantastic stuff. Anya, thank you so much for joining me on this podcast and wish you all the best with the future and really hope that maybe we can do this again sometime. Yeah, totally. This is great. Thank you. Amazing. I really hope that you've enjoyed this installment of the Creative Endeavor podcast and a big thank you to Anya Brock for joining me. Of course, you can find more of Anya's work on her website at anyabrock.com. Now, if you'd like to hear the audio version of this podcast, then you can find that on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, and Podbean. If you like the video version, and you've watched this video right up to this point, then why don't you go ahead and hit that like button for me and leave me a comment down below. I look forward to bringing more episodes of The Creative Endeavor to you very soon.
Now, of course, you know where to find me. I'm on Instagram and Facebook, but most important, make sure you subscribe through my website at andrewtischler.com. Thanks so much for watching. I look forward to seeing you again soon.